four, five, six. It should be okay. Yeah, I hear it. Can you hear it for you? Good morning, everybody. Good morning, and welcome to Party Victoria Park. Especially warm welcome to any visitors we have worshipping with us this morning, and to those joining us via the live stream. A big thank you to everyone who supported the church over our 200th celebration weekend. It's greatly appreciated by Andy and I. Next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, and as such, the service will start at 10.45. All children should go straight through to Young Church and will return towards the end of the service. Our Christmas fair on Saturday the 23rd of November. Tickets are now available, and you can get those from Christine Hill and Shirley Robertson at the end of the service. And the following Saturday, the 30th of November, we're going to hold an Advent lunch and time for Advent reflection. Tickets are available from Maine McIntyre. If you're able to support in the setting up, the baking or donating cakes, serving, cleaning up on the day for either event, please speak to either Christine Hill or May McIntyre. The Winter Church newsletter will be available from Sunday the 1st of December. If MD wishes an article to be included, should you, could you email that or pass it on to May McIntyre by Sunday the 24th of November. In relation to our local church review, Glasgow Presbytery have called a congregational meeting to be held on Tuesday the 26th of November at 7.30 p.m. in the back hall area. Now, also, if you were here last Sunday and you managed to pick up one of these little wooden crosses that Jonathan has kindly provided for us, if not, there are a few still available. You can collect them at the end of the service. Finally, the sale of Boshagri. So I'm going to read out an extract minute of our Kirk Session meeting. The Kirk Session met on Tuesday the 22nd of October 2024 and unanimously agreed to the sale of the Bolshagri Victoria Park Church Building, 230 Broomhill Drive, Glasgow, G11 7QA. The Kirk Session's preference, and we believe the will of the congregation, would be to sell to another Christian denomination or charity in line with our charitable aims, to glorify God and to work for the advancement of Christ's kingdom throughout the world. This has now been sent on to Glasgow Presbytery. Before Andy comes to lead us in worship, we're going to listen to today's children's hymn. everyone good morning good morning and welcome I should have said to Ian about the Bolshagri sale because he asked me 
should I say anything else? And I said, no, that'll be fine. Then I'm sitting there saying, well, maybe we should have said something else. And the thing I think we should have said something else, if you've got any questions, please direct them to Ian. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the cup session have appointed Ian to be responsible for the sale of the building, so Ian's going to have all the information. If you ask anyone else, we're only going to give you our rumours, our thoughts, or whatever it may be. If you're looking for the facts, speak to Ian. He's the best person to go to. Now I've offloaded that. Let's <laughs> We've gathered to worship God. Let us say our call to worship is shown on the screen. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we gather here this morning in this sanctuary in the warmth of this building, in this place where we come together as the people of God. We gather here this morning to offer you our worship. And if we are hungry for more of you, may we find you in this place. If we have any darkness in our life, may your light shine upon us. And may we know your presence as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we bring you this, our worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Can I invite you to stand if you're able to stand and sing, longing for light, we wait in darkness. stand if you're able. Please be seated. 
Good morning, guys. How are we today? How's Alistair today? And Ben, are we thumbs up? Oh, Alistair's got ten fingers up. What's up, Alistair? Are you having a good day? What's up? What's good? Yeah. You're going to see your friend Sandy. And he's two Labradors, and you're going to be playing with the dogs. Is that this afternoon? Well. Oh, you've been bit by a Labrador before? Oh, dear me. <laughs> Don't know. Dear me, poor, poor Alistair. And what about Ben? Oh, you were, you were this, Ben, a minute ago, and you've changed your mind. Do you not have a friend called Sandy with two Labradors? Oh, dear me. The, the dog make a mess of your lawn. Dear me. That's a big loan. Push it, man. Oh. I think, Ben, I think I'll give your dad a wee phone. I think we we'll need to have a, a wee chat with your dad about this lawnmower that you have to push up and down manually because it's not working. Yeah, we'll, we'll leave that with us. We'll see what we can do. And see Collins with us. Good morning, Collins. Thumbs up. And Forbes is, is up at the back. And better not forget Jonathan. Good morning, Jonathan. He's got his thumbs up this morning. I come in to, it was Jonathan's birthday party last night in the church hall. And as soon as they saw me last night, he tried to put his thumbs up. So you did, Jonathan. Because you know me, I'm the thumbs up man. It was a great night, Jonathan. And thank you for inviting us to your birthday. It was Jonathan's birthday on Thursday. Is that correct? It was birthday on Thursday. And 18. Yep, he's getting a big lad. So I think it's... Uh, I think we should sing happy birthday, don't you? Yeah, let's sing happy birthday to Jonathan. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jonathan. Happy birthday to you. I don't know if he was laughing at me or smiling at me, but he certainly there was something. And some good news is that the first Sunday in Advent, Jonathan, along with some others, are going to be coming forward and joining the church. So please let people know that we're going to be having a celebration on the Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, which is what date? First of December. We'll remember that then. The first of December. So please let people know that we're having a special event. Well... I want to ask you a question like I always do. Who's been on a picnic? Anybody been on a picnic? Wait, I'll get my picnic basket. Here's my picnic basket. Who's been on a picnic? Ben, have you been on a picnic? Where did you go to? Can you remember? Was it the park or maybe the beach? Right. You went on a steam train in Germany and had a picnic. Oh, well, that beats my soul coats. <laughs> yeah, you loved it because of the steam train. You had a good time on it. And Colin has been on a picnic as well. Have you been on a picnic, Colin? Did you go to the beach or did you go to the park? You went on a boat. So you've been on a boat. Yeah. Ben's been on a steam train. I've been to soul coats. It's not looking good, is it? And is Jonathan, you've been on a, a picnic, Jonathan? Oh, tell me, an aeroplane, was it, or some? <laughs> no. You went in the car, you went a run, and, and then had a picnic. Well, lots of things happen on picnics, and I was thinking about my picnic basket. If we're going on a picnic, what food do you think we should take? What do you think, Ben? Corn sausages, right, okay. Corn sausages, that's a good suggestion. Alistair, what would you take? Sweeties, you're my man, well done. <laughs> sweeties, Colin. Sandwiches, you would take sweeties. Sandwiches, corn sausages. Anything else? What else would we take on a, a picnic? Who else has got any ideas? What would we take on a picnic? Sausage rolls. Would we take sausage rolls? Are they vegan sausage rolls or just sausage rolls? <laughs> just sausage rolls. Just so Greg sausage rolls. Greg sausage rolls. Yes, yes, yes. 
where we take juice and we take all sorts of stuff and we go out and hoard. The next one, please. Where we take lots of things, where we take sandwiches, where we take cheese. Some people would maybe take cheese and have a cheese board. We take cookies and cakes and chocolate and juice. And I forgot, sorry, Ben, I forgot to put up corn sausages. <laughs> I'll remember that the next time we go on holiday. Now, I wonder if my bag, basket was full of all the things that we've said, do you think we would enough to feed all the children in the church today? Yes, we would enough, so you do. Do you think we would have enough to feed all the adults in the church today? No. no. Why not, Alistair? Because there's not enough food for them, is there? Right. Because there's, right. <laughs> there's only two sandwiches, so there's not enough for everyone, but there's four cookies. So if there's Alistair, Ben, and Andy, that means we can invite one other. Jonathan, that's four. So we've got our four cookies done, so there'll be no cookies for anyone left, would there? No, no. Nothing for mum. Would you share your cookie with mum? Well, maybe. <laughs> maybe the chocolate, but not the cookie. Yes, right, okay, that's right. Honesty is the best way, Ben, it's the best way. So it's, we have a basket, we have enough for, for the children in the church but we don't have enough for everyone because there's only two sandwiches. And I was thinking about that, and there's a stone in the Bible. It's maybe a story you've heard before. Jesus was with his disciples, and there's all these people came to him, and he healed them, and he had compassion for them, and he felt really sorry for them. And then he began to teach them. And then you know what the disciples said? He had a wee basket, he had a wee basket as well. The disciples said, send them away. To get something to eat. There were 5,000 men, plus wives and girlfriends, plus children. And the 12 disciples said, send them away. Send them away. Go and tell them to find something to eat somewhere else. And you know what Jesus said to them, Jonathan? Jesus said to them, you give them something to eat. There is all these people. And Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. And the disciples said, well, we don't have that food. And it would cost eight months' wages to get all that food. And where are we, where are we going to get it all? And Jesus said to them, go out into the crowd, into the crowd, and come back with what you find. And do you know what they found? A little boy who had five loaves, two, Three. <laughs> Four, five. <laughs> he had five small loaves and two fish that had already been put in a tin. <laughs> you see, so that it doesn't get very, very messy. He even put them in the tin for them. Was that great? And I just hope. Peter or John had a tin opener, else they're going to be in trouble. And Jesus says, that, that's enough. Five loaves and two fish is enough to feed all these people. Do you think that would be enough? Do you think so? Why do you think that, Alistair? Because God can make lots of them. Thank you for spoiling my ending. That was really good of you. But yes, you're 100% right. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish and he lifted them up to heaven and he gave thanks to God and then he started saying to his disciples, put everybody in groups of 50 and 100 and then he started giving them food and food and sandwiches and rolls and fish and you know out of his wee basket of five loaves and two fishes he fed over 5,000 people. And then right at the end of it, when everybody was fed, and you ever had a full belly when you've eaten too much? Well, they're all sitting on the grass. Oh, I've really had too much to eat. The best food ever. He says to the disciples, go out and collect everything that's left. And they went out with their wee baskets, and they collected 12 baskets of leftover bread. So there was not enough. There was enough for that day. But there was also enough for breakfast. I just wonder where to get the corn sausages for his breakfast in the morning. There was enough there for breakfast. And why is that, Alistair? You told us. 
because of God. God helped them, blessed them, and they were able to feed 5,000 people and more because God was with them, God blessed, and God fed them. All things with Jesus are possible. Nothing is impossible when we have Jesus in our hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, all these people were there. And Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And that's the same message today. Jesus says to us as children, as adults, as parents, as grandparents, as friends, that when we see people hungry, he says, you give them something to eat. So help us, Lord, to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And have compassion when people are hungry. And help us in whatever way we can to give them something to eat so that they too may have full bellies like most of us this morning. And we ask you, Father, to hear us now as we say together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father. can invite you to stand if you're able as we stand and sing five little loaves and two little fishes let's stand if you're able Father, as the young ones go off and hear more about the miracles of Jesus, be with them, bless them, and look after them until we meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. Off you go, guys. I'm going to invite Margaret to come up and share a few, a few words. We're, we're planning Christmas at the moment, and Margaret needs some help. morning. So yeah, sorry to mention the C word this one. Um, so those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Margaret Umid, formerly Robertson. And yes, I am the Margaret Robertson that was in the photograph last week. And he got a bit of ribbing for forgetting that. Um, but Andy over the last couple of weeks has been talking about passing the baton on. And of course, last weekend, we celebrated our 200th anniversary of worship on this site. And we thank God for the clouds of witnesses that had the vision to set up a place of worship in this area in the Barton Road. But one of the batons that we carry is the Christman tree. And for those of you who don't know, Christman is an abbreviation or put together for Christ monograms. And it started in the 1950s with a lady in America called Frances. And she looked at her Christmas tree in her own church and thought it doesn't have anything to do with Christ. And of course, in 2024, I think we would all agree that Christmas has been very removed from Christ indeed. So um, she started to, went to her minister and he must have been like Andy and said, yeah, carry on. 
and put some white decorations together. She made them by hand. The original ones were made by paper um, to represent Christ. And everything that was on the tree is some symbol of Christ. Um, so that's where Christmas comes from. So, and the symbols are internationally recognized, so things like stars and crosses. And this year, our theme is going to be light, so light of the world. So it's a candle and a lamp, so the old-fashioned lamp on the Girls' Brigade badge, actually. So there's little leaflets at the front to show you what the symbols are like. And there's a few things that are important for Christmas trees. So the first thing is that it's got to be a real tree, so, you know, Christ is alive and living. And the lights have got to be white, so Christ as the light of the world. And the decorations or ornaments, as she called them, have got to be white and or gold. So white for innocence and purity and gold for Christ's um, glory after resurrection. So, and there's a couple of things about the decorations. They should be handmade and they should be made and given in love. And the tree should be added to every year as an indication of our growing faith. And that's really important. So since the 90s, this church has um, had a Christmas tree and we've had some very beautiful handmade decorations over the years. Um, some of them have been knitted or crocheted or um, cross-stitch. And I would like to ask you this year, because I know there are lots of creative people in the congregation, if you would consider making a Christmas for the tree. So remember, it's got to be white and or gold. Um, we are hoping, Inga and I are hoping to have some decorations for you to decorate at the uh, coffee day at the end of the month. But if you're a knitter or a crochet or if you like cross stitch, I know that that takes a bit of time. So I'm giving you advance warning. Um, and you can bring them at any time during Advent to add to the tree that will be in the sanctuary. So thank you very much in anticipation. And thanks to our cloud of witnesses that have gone before us for passing on the baton and hopefully we can carry it for many years to come. Thank you. Just on the, the magic C word, uh, the cup session have agreed that Irene Glover will look after the sanctuary area, not the tree, the sanctuary area and, and the church entrance. So if you have any ideas, offers of support, whatever it may be, please speak to Irene. And Kerry is going to, our young church leader is going to be looking after the back hall and the young church room. So again, the same thing. If you've got any ideas, offers of support, whatever it may be, please speak to Kerry. They're the people to go through and not me. That's another thing I've offloaded today as well. So please speak to them and they're the ones who are going to take it forward on behalf of the congregation. We continue in our worship as we come before the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we think about our world this morning, as we think about our city, as we think about our parish, as we think about our church, as we think about ourselves, we can see, Lord, many mistakes. We can see many things that are wrong. We can see where we struggle in our lives to bring you honor and glory. So this morning, Lord, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that we can celebrate Christmas when it comes. We thank you that we can have fun and laughter and presents and gifts. But most of all, we thank you for your son. The son who came and lived and taught. The one who died on a cross. Who shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. And who rose again on that first Easter morning. We thank you for Jesus. Because with him. There is a path out of our darkness. There is a path. For us to move forward in joy and in love. And that path begins with forgiveness. So as we examine our own hearts and examine our own lives, we come before you, Lord, and we ask you to forgive us this morning. To forgive us for any way that we have lived our lives 
that grieves your heart. For any way we have thought or said or done something that is not of your teaching. Forgive us when we haven't prepared to come and meet with you this morning. To gather in this place. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, to bring to the forefront of our minds anything that we need to repent of. Anything in our lives, Lord, that sadden you, as well as saddens us in its remembrance. And as the Holy Spirit brings those things before our very own minds, in the silence of our hearts, in the silence of the sanctuary, Lord, we bring them before the cross of Calvary, And we ask you once more, Father, to forgive us as we bring you the very prayers of our confession. Hear our hearts, Lord. Hear our hearts. Heavenly Father, we are sinners in need of grace. And because of your son Jesus who died and rose again for us, that grace is freely available to everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. And we, Lord, who have prayed our confession silently through our hearts, we are crying out to Jesus this morning, forgive us and thank you. Thank you that those sins that we have confessed are now gone. The slate is wiped clean. We can start again. So help us, Lord, to be those people, to start again fresh, and to make our today better than our yesterday, and our tomorrow brighter than our today. Be with us in our struggles, be with us in our joy, Be with us in our happiness. Be with us in our sadness. Be with us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. I can invite you to stand if you're able as our offering is brought forward. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, bless this offering that we bring before you. May it be pleasant in your sight, and may it be used for the advancement of your kingdom here in Glasgow and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. I'd like to invite Roberta to come and share our reading for this morning. Today's reading is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, reading verses 30 to 44. This is on page 1009 of the Pew Bibles and on the screen. Jesus feeds the 5,000. The apostles gathered round Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized them and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. 
So he began teaching them many things. By this time, it was late in the day, so his disciples came to him. This is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so that they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. They said to him, that would take eight months of a man's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have, he asked. Go and see. When they found out, they said, five and two fish. Then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples to set before the people. He also divided the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of the men who had eaten was 5,000. Amen and praise be to God. Please stand if you are able as we sing, I heard the voice of Jesus say. If you have a, a problem or maybe something's broken, whom do you turn to? Well, when it comes to car repairs, plumbing, joinery, technology, I think you'll all agree I have a very limited knowledge. If I have a problem, let's say, with my car, or with the computer. I normally log on to YouTube 
type in the details and then see if I can find how to fix it. When that doesn't work, as some of you will know, the next thing is to text someone or email someone in the church and say, can you help? And if that doesn't work, I'm left with one option. Go to another expert and seek support. In the man's bathroom, a leak has developed above the shower head and the ceiling is damp. So I went up and had a look. I took some pictures and then I went down onto YouTube, typed in how to fix a leaky ceiling. And all these videos came up and I had a look at them. I went up and tried some things. I got my trusty spanner and my screwdrivers and a big torch and I had a look at it and I tried and I went, this is a way beyond my ability. So I go downstairs and get on the phone and I find a man who can. A man who can fix the problem. And he's coming tomorrow at 8 o'clock in the morning. I tried to negotiate 9 o'clock, but he wasn't for it. So he's coming at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning, and I'm sure he's the expert who's going to fix my leaky ceiling. This is similar to what we see happening in today's reading. When a problem is put into the hands of Jesus, there is a solution. The disciples struggled to deal with the reality of their situation. But when they put it into the hands of Jesus, we see what happened, who were fed, and the result. So we pick up today's story from where we left off two weeks ago, just after the disciples had been out on their first training mission. And we begin at verses 30 and 31, where we see Jesus' concern for the people. The apostles had returned from that first mission trip and they must have been exhausted. They had visited the towns and villages all around about them. They preached the kingdom of God is near. They healed the sick. They cast out demons. And that's hard work. That work takes it really out of you. And no doubt the people in the towns where they had healed, etc., started to follow them. Who wouldn't follow a healer. If someone can heal someone in your family, you're going to start following, looking after, watching where they go. And if you have someone else who needs healed, you're going to bring them along with you and you're going to keep bringing them. They reported back to Jesus all they had done. And since there were so many people beginning to gather and they didn't have time to eat something, Jesus says, let's go away for a wee trip. Let's get in the boat We'll sail around the, site, the Sea of Galilee. We'll get to a nice quiet place and you can get some rest. Jesus was concerned for the well-being of the disciples. He was concerned for the well-being of his workers. So he says to them, come. Come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. Can you think of somewhere else in the Bible where it talks about a quiet place. A quiet place where you can maybe get some rest. Maybe this verse from the Bible. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. In echoes of the 23rd Psalm, we see Jesus taking his disciples to a place of peace and tranquility. A place where they can be refreshed, rested, re-energized and restored. Now some of you know, many of you know, that I had a heart attack back in April. And I have to say, following my heart attack, it changed me. It changed me from the poacher to the gamekeeper. You'll be familiar with that saying. You see, I was a workaholic. I worked seven days a week, often burning the candles at both ends. And I believe Jesus didn't give me a heart attack. That was my doing. That was the choices I made in my life with my weight and the food I was eating, etc., that caused the problem. So Jesus didn't give me a heart attack, but I believe Jesus used it. I believe he used it to teach me a valuable lesson so that the poacher turned gamekeeper can hopefully teach you a valuable lesson today. The valuable lesson was this. Rest. 
to rest and spend time in his presence and to spend quality time with my wife and family. To take a Sabbath rest, to go to a quiet place, to enjoy his company, a place where he can quench my thirst and refresh my soul. And just like his concern for his disciples, he is also concerned for me. And the good news is, he is also concerned for you. So whatever struggle you may be facing today, whatever it may be, come to Jesus. Come to him and rest in his presence. Spend quality time with him and allow him to take you to that place of tranquility. That place that we read in the psalm, the quiet waters, a place where he can refresh your soul. James, the brother of Jesus, writes this in his epistle at chapter 4. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. You know, in your troubles, are you drawn near to God? In your, your, your life, your, your problems, whatever it may be, are you coming to God? Are you drawn near to him? Because if you do that, God will draw near to you. Not only does God have concern, but he also has compassion. Verses 32 to 34. Jesus says to the disciples, let's get out of here, it's getting too busy. Let me take you on a wee retreat somewhere, somewhere nice where we can spend some time together. So they set sail and they cut across the Sea of Galilee. And there in the distance you see the crowd falling round the shoreline watching where the boats go, chasing after Jesus and the disciples. And I wonder how the disciples felt in the boat as they watched that crowd running round the side of the coast. I wonder how they felt when the crowd arrived at the place of retreat before they arrived there. I think it goes something like this. It's a Monday and the man's phone rings. And on the end of it, someone says, I know it's your day off, but... I know it's your day off, but... Or I don't answer the phone, and I just let it go into the answer phone, and it's the same message. I wonder if that's how the disciples felt. Can you just tell them to go away? Jesus, can you just tell them to get lost? We've got a chance to spend time with you. And here's all these folk coming and annoying us. Can we not just have that time, Jesus? When the boat docks at the harbour side, Jesus sees the last crowd and he's filled with compassion for them. Why is he filled with compassion? Well, it tells us there towards the end of those verses. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In the Old Testament book of Numbers at chapter 27, we read this. Moses said to the Lord, May the Lord, the God who gives breath to all living things, appoint someone over his community to go out and come in before them, one who will lead them out and bring them in, so the Lord's people will not be like a sheep without a shepherd. When Jesus sees the people are lost, lost in their sins, lost in their pain, lost in their suffering, lost in their grieving. His natural instinct is compassion. For they are a sheep without a shepherd. It tells us in Matthew and Luke's gospel the same story, that they healed the sick. And both Mark and Luke say he began to teach them. And Luke's gospel, he's really specific about this matter. In Luke chapter 9, he says, he welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. When Jesus had compassion on the crowd, the first thing he did was give them a sermon. Now, I don't know about you, but when I'm struggling, when I'm grieving, when I'm in pain, when there's a problem, the last thing I want to hear is a preacher give a sermon. But that's what Jesus did. The first thing he did, he told them that the kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is in hand. Repent and believe. 
And I humbly suggest that he preached the kingdom of God is at hand. Because by doing that, people would hear why he came. You see, I think if he healed the people first, I wonder how many would drift off. I wonder how many would say, thanks very much, that's me healed, I'm away now. They wouldn't hear the message. They wouldn't hear the message that he was sent by his father to bring. A message of love and grace and forgiveness and closeness, of compassion, of concern. They would drift off. But I think Jesus preaches this message to them and then he heals the people. He heals the people because they're there. There's over 5,000 of them. And I don't think any of them left. I think what they heard, what he had to say, saw his miracles and stayed put. You see, I believe Jesus knows that our greatest need is a spiritual one. Our spiritual healing, our spiritual well-being is more important to Jesus than our physical. That our greatest need is forgiveness and salvation. And I think we're the same as these people on the hillside. You see, I believe there's no point in being fully restored if our eternal destination is not with God. Be honest with yourself. Would you rather have heaven than the guarantee of heaven and an affliction or a full healing and eternal separation from God? I think that's a choice that we face. And when I think in my own situation, I would rather have another 120 heart attacks and have Jesus in the room with me in the hospital than be fully fit and not have Jesus anywhere with me. Because Jesus gives us the compassion spiritually to cope with the physical pains and sufferings, whatever we may be. He offers that to all of us. But we face the problem of, do we accept that? Do we just want to be healed and then have nothing to do with them? And Jesus says, we'll have a greater prize. The greater prize is you may not have a healing in this life, but you have a healing in the life to come. So accept me and accept the compassion I offer. And then we had a problem. There's a 5,000 people plus on the hill and we have conflicting ideas in verses 35 to 38. They're in a remote, a remote place. It's getting late in the day and the disciples suggest, Jesus, send them away to get some food. Now, I think that sounds pretty reasonable, don't you? You look at what you've got in your purse, your wallet, your bank account. There's 5,000 people there. You look at what you've got and you go, send them away. I think that's a pretty good idea. And I think I would be one of the disciples there. I don't even have enough to feed myself and you want me to feed 5,000 plus people. Send them away. It's been a long, hard day, Jesus. I've worked really hard this week. I've healed people. I've cast out demons. I've done all this work for you. I'm pretty done in. I'm looking forward to my retreat. Send them away. And then I can just imagine Jesus' face, with that wee smirk on his face as he says, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. You feed them. I think I would look at Jesus and say, you having a laugh? You kidding on? There's over 5,000 folk there, Jesus. How, how am I going to feed them? It would take eight months' wages, even though we could get the food, which we can't. It's going to take eight months', eight months wages, and we're going to waste all that money in feeding these folk and giving them bread and, and whatever else we can get. Then I think I would say something like this to Jesus. I think I would try and pull him to the side and say, there's no Costco's. There's no Morrison's. There's no McDonald's or Blue Lagoon Chippies. Jesus, you need to tell him to go. And Jesus says again, you give them something to eat. 
So we have these reluctant disciples. They want to send the people away. And Jesus says, no, they're staying. And we have a conflict of ideas. One says, send them away and they'll find food themselves. Let them go and do it themselves. And the other one says, you give them something to eat. Tell them to stay. So Jesus gets his reluctant disciples and he says, go into the crowd and come back with what you find. And depending on how you read the different Gospels, we know at the end of it all, a small boy brings five small barley loaves and a couple of sardines. 5,000 people plus in a crowd, and there's only one mum who prepared their son to bring their lunch. I've got to worry about all the other mums in a crowd that day. I mean, what were they doing with their kids? How were they feeding their kids? But one mum had a great idea. There you go, son. There's five wee loaves, a couple of sardines. Go and enjoy your day with Jesus. Have great fun. Away you go. I can just imagine those disciples saying to Jesus, there you go. There you are. See, we're right. You see, this is all we have. Five wee loaves, a couple of fish. Look at all the people. These are the same disciples who'd only a few days earlier healed the sick and cast out demons. And Jesus had just given them another authority in his name. The authority to provide. But they looked at the magnitude of the problem, of the situation, from their earthly perspective and said, we can't do it. Are we not just like them? We look at our situation from an earthly perspective and we say it's impossible. Jesus looked at the same situation, the meager amount of food before him. He looked from a heavenly perspective and he sees a solution. I think some of us today need to go and get our eyes checked. I think some of us need to change our vision. From stop looking at everything from an earthly perspective and start to look for it from a heavenly perspective. We need to start seeing our problems not from an earthly viewpoint, but from a heavenly standpoint. We need to stop telling God how big our problem is and start telling our problems how big our God is. How big our God is. And the, the Alistair said earlier, there is nothing impossible for God. So let's see what happens when the disciples put their problems in the hands of Jesus. When there is a change of perspective. Verses 39 to 44, creation's hands. Jesus takes this ridiculous supply from the hands of his reluctant disciples. He instructs the people to go and sit on the green grass. We'll come back to that in a minute. He tells them to go and sit in the green grass in groups of hundreds and fifties. Now math isn't my strong point, but fifties, that's a lot of groups. Hundreds, that's a lot of people. He says, go and put them into these groups of fifties and hundreds, tell them to sit in the green grass. He takes a meager offering, he gives a heavenly perspective, and then he starts to distribute the fruit, the, the food. More bread, more fish, more bread, more fish, more bread, more fish. And we read that everyone is satisfied. Everyone sitting back, rubbing their tummy. That was great. What a feast. What a feast. And then I think he teaches the disciples a wee lesson. Because he tells us there's 12 baskets left over. And disciples and, and people who were travelers and followers, there was a wee basket. One of these wee money bags we often put our, our money in on holiday. Or if we go to Spain, we buy a wee bag to put our, our wee things in, our bits and pieces in. They've all got one of these wee baskets. And I think he teaches them a lesson by saying, go and pick up the leftovers to give them time to think. To think, what have we just said? What have we done? They looked at it from an earthly perspective. But in the hands of Jesus, he looks at it from a heavenly perspective. And miracles happen. 
from allow him to deal with what we struggle with. And that day, there is over 5,000 witnesses to what Jesus did. 5,000 eyewitnesses on a hillside that can testify that this is happening. And I've never read anything in the history of the world where one of those people say, I brought the lunch myself, I just didn't tell anybody. 5,000 people witnessed a miracle. Concern, compassion, conflicting ideas, creation hands. Remember that green grass that they all sat on? They weren't out in the desert. They were sitting in the rocks. They were sitting in lovely green grass, enjoying their picnic. Does it remember you have another verse where there's lovely green grass? Psalm 23 again. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. Everyone was fed and satisfied. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Have you ever had, had that much to eat so you need to eat, you need to go and have a lie down somewhere? I know I have. They were full to the gunnels. They're on the green grass and they lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Even I throw, I walk through the darkest valley. I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. They comfort me because you're concerned about me. You prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I was thinking about today's reading, the Holy Spirit led me to this psalm time and time and time again. If we put our life in the hands of the Creator, in the hands of the Good Shepherd, and we change our perspective, Jesus takes us to green pastures, he leads us beside quiet waters, he refreshes our souls, and we lack nothing. Nothing. He leads us through our darkest times because he's concerned for us. And he brings us comfort and peace. He anoints our heads with oil of gladness until we come to a place where joy is overflowing. And he will be with us all the days of our lives until the day we spend eternity in his very presence in the glories of heaven. Today I just want to finish with this. What is your five loaves and two fishes? What are your five loaves and two fishes? Are you tired of carrying a burden? Are you sick of the way you're feeling? Are you fed up with the addiction that you struggle with? Can you see no future and no hope? Then can I encourage you to bring your five loaves and two fishes. Bring them to Jesus. Put them in his hands. And allow him to bring you to the place of the 23rd Psalm. Allow his heavenly perspective to change your earthly perspective and rest in him. Let us pray. Friends, I want you to think about, just for a moment, what are your five loaves and two fishes? What is the problems, situations that you're facing today? Are you willing to hand that over to Jesus? Are you willing to hand that situation over to Jesus and allow him to raise it heavenward, to bless it, and for God's love to pour out in abundance? Just come to Jesus and now with your five loaves and two fishes and ask him, this is all I have. This is my pain, my suffering, my anguish, my grieving. This is all I have. 
will you bless it? Will you bless it and be with me? And I believe if you've did that this morning, then Jesus will bless you beyond your wildest dreams. In Jesus' name. Amen. We stand again if you're able to stand and sing. All I once held dear built my life upon. stand up your able. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've just been thinking about concern, compassion, conflicting ideas, creation's hands. And we gather today, Lord, because we are concerned for our planet. We're concerned, Lord, for the way we look after it, for the way we've treated it. We're concerned, Lord, because of the wars that rage throughout many countries, many nations. We're concerned, Lord, for our own city and the struggles that we face within it. So we pray, Father, pour compassion upon us. Pour out your compassion upon each one of us your compassion throughout every nation so that we can live in peace, so we can enjoy the words of the 23rd Psalm, so we can 
without conflicting ideas. Help us to trust in you, Father, for only you can help us solve the problems that we face. So may we turn to the hands of creation, come back to you, be with you, and ask you to help us, Lord. Ask you to help us, Lord, to help us solve the world's problems, but not on our own, but only with Jesus by our side leading us. We are many, Lord, in this congregation. We're a diverse congregation. So we take a few moments in silence, Lord, to bring our own personal prayers for this world, for our city, for our families, for ourselves before you. And we ask you, Lord, to hear our prayer. We offer a prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Just before we sing our, our final hymn, there is a tea and coffee through in our church hall. There's also some birthday cake, some biscuits, some other treats from Jonathan's birthday party last night. But I have to say, if you're looking for a bit, you'll need to be quick. So uh, no stampedes as you run through, but everyone's invited and welcome to join us. And also, if you never managed to pick up one of our 200th anniversary crosses last week we have some at the door so please see them at the door and we'll make sure you can get some of them also we finish by standing to sing what a friend we have in Jesus all our sins and griefs to bear <laughs> As you go from this place, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen.